enable us to share these events more widely with people beyond um, beyond this call. Um, and what we like to do at COP26 is take topics like law and engineering and science and try and translate them into ways that people can really take action on climate change. Um, and after this, I'll show you some of the resources that we that we try and develop. Particularly, we've developed a resource on the Paris Agreement, for example, that's available um, in English and Italian. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just um, share my screen very briefly and just take you through some upcoming events that we have, as well as this one. Um, coming up to tomorrow and the day after um, so tomorrow we've got engineering for the energy transition it's all about engineering and, and and then the day after climate change and the future of jobs so we very much hope that you'll join us for those ones as well uh, and really look forward to to welcoming you there um, so with that i will pass over to uh, a friend in, friend uh, at yari marco volpe to introduce a bit about um, yari and their organization over to you marco thank you sama thank you for for your kind words i'm really happy to be here we with you i'm really happy you know to share this event with cop 26 and beyond this quite a few months that we are we are speaking about this and finally we we, we are here so i'm really really happy and proud to share the the screen and the platform with you. I am Marco Volpe, the brand ambassador of Yari. I am also a PhD researcher at the University of Lapland and editor in chief at Yari for the Arctic region. Uh, so, what is Yari? Just a few words about Yari and what we do in Yari. Yari is the um, Institute for International Relational Analysis, based in Italy, and is an Italian think tank made, made up by different professionals committed to editing specialized and analytical geopolitical papers. The main aim of this is actually to, to enhance and develop the role of the geopolitical analyst in Italy that is quite uh, you know, overlooked. Uh, this is the reason why we are also committed to, to, to raise awareness and knowledge about climate change. And this is the reason why we are here today speaking in the all for climate framework with friends of COP26 and beyond. Uh, we want to give to give our contribution to climate change debate in national and international arenas, uh, and thanks to the expertise of our team, we are able to cover all the region of the world. Uh, and also, we obviously speaks about uh, topics that really matter, such as climate uh, climate change. We also cover uh, region all the region of the world, from Europe to Asia to the Arctic to the U.S. to Russia. And actually, our job consists of in producing analytical papers, interviews, uh, dossier focus, uh, and also organizing webinars with professionals, with professors. And we also offer classes to those who are interested in, uh, in improving their professional knowledge and their expertise on some, some area of, of geopolitical area of the world. So again, I'm really happy to share this experience with friends from COP26 and beyond. Uh, and uh, I think that is quite a really uh, good opportunity for us, for us an institute, for all the people involved in this in this event to share ideas and to speak about something that matters to us very uh, at all. So uh, just a few words before I give the word back to you, Sam. We invite all of you to visit our website that is yari.site and for our social networks on Facebook, on LinkedIn and on Instagram. Thank you again and back to you, Sam. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Marco. Um, so let's just run through a little bit about how, how we hope today will work. Um, we're going to start with a short film that we're really proud to have been part of um, the process of developing called Using the Law to Fix Climate Change. Um, and that was made by young environmental filmmakers featuring four young climate activists and something that we produced with Eastside Educational Trust. And um, then we'll hear some comments for some um, young uh, law graduates and law delegates, I, I think. Um, Elvis may be here, but we're certainly here from um, Atif Ishmael. Um, so it'd be fantastic to get his reflections on the film. Um, then we'll have uh, William Wilson, who's an expert environmental barrister and co-founder of COP26 and beyond. 
and then after that a chance for some discussion so we really welcome your comments both in the chat and we'll hear um uh, give you the opportunity to speak as well at that point to reflect on those and then following that um we're we're really pleased to welcome julia panicia um who is a uh, recent graduate of Foscari university in venice where she researched the links between climate change and the human right to health um, and similarly we'll have a chance for discussion on some of the topics that julia um, raises and then we'll have a chance for a more general discussion about some of the issues and as i say really welcome your engagement your comments your questions and um, so get thinking about those as we go along so without further ado uh, i'm going to start this um this session off by sharing this short film um, using the law to fight climate change. have leaders who can come up with a law which can favor environment, human beings, animals, also can favor the planet. We usually blame most of our leader and also the government because they're the one who are responsible. Governments have influence over the regulations they put in place to regulate firms and corporations. Taking action and lobbying and emailing your MP is so important so that the people in parliament and the people with power realize that young young people like myself are invested in climate action governments have to care about young people and they have to take into account young people um, in all future decisions we are a force and um, we are an important stakeholder group there is more we can do you know apart from you know taking placard and walking to the streets to protect apart from signing petitions we can actually take this position of leadership to influence some of these policies you know that we want to see happen mock cop is an international virtual youth climate summit it was to fill the void of climate action. They did regional caucuses and small groups discussing perhaps what policies they wanted to see as an outcome of the two week event. They unveiled the COP26 treaty, which now in phase two of the campaign are trying to get some of the policies implemented in different countries around the world. For example, in the UK, we have Teach the Future, which is kind of like the, the main climate education campaign. And what we're hoping is that at COP26, a couple of people from MOTCOP or Teach the Future will be able to go and discuss with education ministers on Zoom and then environmental ministers about climate change education, because we think it's obviously very important. We were reached out to by, by the firm Equity Generation Lawyers, and they were wanted to bring a class action on behalf of all young people around Australia and needed some name litigants. And so they reached out to School Strike for Climate because we were and still are the biggest cli youth climate movement in Australia. And so from there, we, we got in touch with lawyers um, and, and we, we've been in touch with them ever since. Um, and so we, we filed the case, Sharma. And that one's through the courts forcing the environment minister to not approve coal mines because of her duty of care to young people. Um, it's subject to an appeal but that if it's held up, that this holds a very strong precedent that can be applied in cases in Australia, but we also hope around the world was the first case of its kind. Um, and so that question hadn't been tested in, in a court of law, at least in Australia. Um, and so the, the courts just hadn't had to answer the question. Legal litigation, legal activism is a strong way of activism and a strong way of forcing, because if you get, you get the good outcome, you force change. Africa is not a dumpster. Fossil fuel company, including Shell, they wanted to export the plastic waste material into Kenya. So here in Kenya, we have been able to ban plastic a long time ago. So we were able to tell them clearly why it's very bad for our government of Kenya to accept this plastic. The government were able to state very well that they are not going to accept such a deal. I found that the Go to Green movement, we go to about six of my friends, and that was when we decided to develop a theory of you know, how we want to affect change. Um, that was when we decided that we'll be mobilizing the collective power of youth and community to improve climate awareness and climate literacy, because we believe that climate literacy 
on a very fundamental scale we need to climate action. Two years down the line, we have a network of about 700 activists. Drop the concept that these policymakers don't want to act. Make a case for why you want to see them. Make it about action, what we can do and not what we are not doing. Framing and narrative is very important. Before you come up with a campaign, you need to come up with a clear message which you can send out to people to understand what you are fighting for. Get your friends involved, get your family involved, get your school involved, get everyone in your community involved. Turn urgency into creativity. It's only through a mass movement of people that we can force change. Make it about action, you know, what we can do and not what we are not doing. Be yourself. Don't be like Greta. So you need to come up with your own way to see how you're going to fight because we are the future generation and also we are the future leader. everyone it's uh... dangers of youtube okay so thank you very much for, for for watching that um and now i'd just like to turn to um atif ishmael just if you wouldn't mind so atif you are if i've got this right um a uh, law student at, at swansea university um with a particular interest in in environmental law and, and nature and um, but you're also a young, a young person really engaged in the lawmaking process. So when you look at some of the issues in that film, um, I'd be really interested to know what you thought and what your sort of reactions are. Um, yeah, hello everyone, yeah. Um, really nice film, first of all, yeah. Um, the thing is that when you talk about the law to fix climate, law is first of all, I'd like to say quite a blunt instrument in a way. You know, you tell someone not to do something in the law really and you punish them for it rather than making a kind of change in in the environment itself, if you know what I mean. It's nice to know that people, there are campaigns to educate people, really, because no one really educated me in school or anything about all this. It was, well, there were, were things, but not such huge campaigns that there are about now. But yeah, I don't, I'm not trying to be negative, but I don't entirely, I'm not entirely sure how the law could help with climate change because the law is more about punishing people, I'd like to think, more than making a change in climate. Um, okay, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I know it's probably you... a comment you didn't expect, but that's what no, I No, not at all, not at all, yeah, no. It's, yeah. it's, 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 a great, it's a great place to start a debate. Um, could I just yeah. ask one, one more question then? So how did you yourself get into um the idea of the lawmaking process and and what advice would you give to other young people interested in getting interested in that area and and, and using it um particularly in environmental ways um, well first of all i took a, a module called nature conservation law back in my second year and um yeah i just saw you know we we, we got this question about all the problems with one piece of act was the wildlife and countryside act 1981 and uh, all the problems with it you know and um and yeah i just saw it more of as a blunt instrument really it, it was more about really punishing people than talking about how to fix things you know oh if that person you know goes and dumps fossil fuels in the river they're going to get fined and all that's not more about what's um you know what's um why you shouldn't throw fossil fuels into the river so it's more kind of that really that got me involved to think okay. about more future as a career really thank you very much oh well it was really interesting to, to hear from you and i'm sure we will do again in in, in the following discussions so thank, thank you, you very much for joining us um we're going to turn now to um william wilson um who is co-founder of cop 26 and beyond um but also a expert environmental barrister um and 
uh, I will share these slides and William will give a short presentation on, on using the law to fix the climate. Um, okay, one second. <coughs> Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Can you hear that okay? Yes. Great, and th thanks for that. And thanks for Atif, uh, you know, that's a, that's a good challenging basis to start off with, you know, what's this all about? I, I completely agree with you on one level and, and I slightly disagree with you on another. I, I completely agree with you that the law isn't the answer to everything. Um, and I've always been very much aware of the fact that it's only kind of like one slice of the cake, one piece of the action, one one part of the answer to how you can fix the, the, the climate. It's just one thing that needs to be done. Uh, and along with all the other stuff, you've got to have access to the best science, you've got to have access to the best engineering solutions, to finance, to banking, to everything else. Um, but I do think that it is a, a, a part and an essential part of of the answer and and therefore that as lawyers we need to consider what we can do to to contribute our part um of of the answers to what's a massive problem for the whole of whole of society i mean what i want to do is to talk about two particular aspects first of all making laws and the second the importance of enforcing the laws um which will come back to atif's point in 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 a, in a minute can I have the next slide, please? If you go back to what, what it is and why we should get involved, it, all it is is a rule that is set by society about what it wants to do about a particular issue. And usually there's a sanction, as Atif said, if you breach it. So it, it's simply society saying, we want this result and here's the sanction if you breach it. But what I argue is that it affects everyone and so everyone has an interest in how these laws are made. In very narrow issues, you may just say, okay, I'm gonna step back and leave it all to the experts to tell me what the law is gonna be. And I'll just do what they say. Uh, and even in big issues, for example, like uh, COVID-19, you know, to some extent, society steps back from the lawmaking process and just leaves the experts to tell it um, what what the answer is going to be, what we have to do in order to try and address this terrible pandemic. But with big issues like climate change, um, we all have an interest in the outcome. And my argument is that we 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 all have to 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 get involved if you want the laws to be to be better because otherwise they're made by a little coterie of people at the center who tell you in a kind of anarch way that that this is how it's going to be this is what you've all got to do and it's going to end up affecting all aspects of your life without your having had any say and that makes for weaker laws so what i argue if i could go on to the next slide what I'm really arguing is that uh, we have to make greater efforts to take society with you in the lawmaking process. Uh, the, the bigger the issue, the, the harder you have to work, I think, to take society with you and to deliver what we call the consent of the governed. Um, if you want a law to work really well, the ones that work best, in my experience anyway, are the ones where, where society understands them they share the objective, they strongly support them. They say, yeah, I accept that's relevant to my problems. I understand what you're trying to do and I basically will go along with it. But the more you place demands on society, the harder you need to work to make sure that you're taking society with you. Climate change and the energy transition to net zero, so far as we understand it, is gonna change just about everything it's going to change work, it's going to change jobs, homes, travel, energy, agriculture. So what I say is politicians and indeed climate activists, they need to redouble their efforts to take society along and to get them to buy in to the, the results that we're trying to achieve. Can I have the next slide, please? I mean, just to pick up on one of the 
the the themes of that film the the, the young people at mock cop were incredibly organized there were 330 climate activists and from 142 countries and they formulated their demands and they they debated them and they put them into the form of a treaty and if you have the next slide they they were so organized that they got the president of cop to come to their own opening ceremony and to discuss with them and it's a fascinating um little clip uh, if you have the chance to see it how that is important to him in giving him the political space to press for greater ambition in climate climate change uh, uh, and so on so can I have the next slide please and the other element of what i want to to um address is the is the implementation and enforcement and here i would take a bit of issue with with atif because i think this is a this is a global problem it's certainly one which we have in england but it's also one that that is occurs in many countries as the united nations environment program put it while environmental laws have become commonplace across the globe too often they exist mostly on paper because government implementation and enforcement is irregular incomplete and ineffective and that's a problem for our national laws and i would also argue it's a problem for climate laws unless we address it can i have the next slide please so in 2015 we had the paris agreement on climate change and if that was enough on its own then emissions would be going down by now wouldn't they because um you know it was a huge political achievement and a diplomatic achievement but you see from this graph at the Mauna Loa Observatory, the actual level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going on and on and up and up. And so what COP26 is really about is because we know what the science is now, there's a huge sign off on the science and 195 countries have signed up to the IPCC's latest report. So it's really a question of what they're prepared to do about it. Can I have the next slide? so when you come to whatever is going to be agreed or not agreed at cop 26 it's going to result in national laws in a whole lot of different areas there are already laws in the uk anyway on net zero and at european level for italy that that's been that's been legislated at a european level on nationally determined contributions again in, in the UK and Europe and many other countries on plans for 2030 on the energy transition on transport home heating cooling insulation in every case you'll have to have engineering and you'll have to have technical solutions but you'll also need I would argue clear laws effective independent well-resourced enforcement clear aims visible targets good communication and public support. And maybe like, like you did with that Sharma case that we we saw in the film, maybe you'll need legal challenges to failures to enforce. So I would say there are plenty of opportunities for you to get involved in influencing and improving the laws and indeed in making them in the first place. The benefit if you do is that we could end up with better established, better made laws that enjoy further public support and are therefore stronger as a result. I think I'll stop there and see if uh, you'd like to pick up on those points in the discussion. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, William. Um, that's really appreciated and a lot to think about. Um, so we've got a little bit of time now for discussion. Um, if if anyone would like to contribute, you can at the bottom of your screen you can raise your hand, um, and and um, I will uh, come to you. Would anyone like to come in? Atif, over to you. Um, yeah, hi, uh, William. You said about the law enforcement. Yeah, I totally agree with you about that. And what is your opinion on how the best way the law can be enforced? Environmental laws. What what needs to change for better enforcement? Kind of. 
Well, there's two different aspects to it. I think that I think Julia may be going to talk about uh, international law enforcement and and the machinery that that maybe you know you can add to a treaty to make it more effective. Uh, and you know I won't preempt that, and I'll, I'll leave that to, to to Julia because I think she's going to look at that aspect of it. In terms of national law, um, national laws, I I I'm quite agnostic on this. I don't really mind how you enforce it as long as it works and and works well and i do think that public opinion and public support public understanding is is a really important component of it um but i don't really have a great theology about it should be criminal or it should be civil and administrative i think whichever works whichever works best i spent a year in the states looking at how they base a lot of their enforcement on on civil and administrative enforcement, and that was very effective. Uh, in the UK, we've tended to rely more on criminal law, which is a bit um, distorting in some ways because you have to sort of go through all these criminal procedures to prove that a company was criminal. And it really, it just needs to be an effective sanction. And people have to recognize that a breach of the law is not an acceptable outcome. Otherwise, it becomes a cheaper way of achieving things. <clears throat> Perfect. Um, would anyone else like to come in? Please raise your hand and 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 feel free to um, feel free to interject. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, oh, sorry, Marco. Did you have one? Over to you. No, 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 not at the moment. No. Okay. Um, so uh, it's really interesting to hear, um, but I think so myself and perhaps others on the call um, may not be lawyers. So one thing I would ask is, could you say a bit more about <coughs> why all this is relevant to people who aren't lawyers? You know, why does it matter? How can we get involved if you're a student or if you're a researcher or, you know, if you're just a, an, an other member of the public? Um, and how how do we get involved without having a legal training or a legal background? Yeah, well, I think the the, the film addressed some of those those themes, uh, and and the the young people involved in the in the, in the film addressed some of those themes pretty effectively, actually. I think because what they were saying is that they they knew where they wanted to get to, they knew the result they wanted, and and. It was simply exploring with them how law is one way of, of advancing towards that. Um, you know, I mean, for example, tomorrow we'll be talking about engineering uh, and, <clears throat> and, and, and clearly none of this is going to work with, without that. L law doesn't exist in a vacuum. And to make a law on something like the climate, you need to be informed by climate science. You need to be informed by technical things. You can't just say, you must, you must uh, give up fossil fuels and, and move to renewables unless you know how renewables will work. You need to be informed by finance uh, and, and you know, understand the financial implications of the law. And so there's, a, there's a many, many disciplines that, that have to go into it. And, and all I think is, is the saying is this, is this is one way of addressing some of the concerns that you have. If you mind about the climate, um, you, you want it to, to be addressed. If it's not being addressed, if it's not being delivered, you have to ask, you know, what, what further steps could be taken? I certainly think it's the case that, that if you do get the public more broadly involved in, in lawmaking, you, you end up with better laws. I'll give you an example. In the States, in the United States, they have a Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act. And they enjoy enormous public support because they're very well grounded. They're very well understood. And Brian, you know, despite all the polarization that you get in the States and all the sort of political um, <clears throat> standoff, you, you'll find that successive presidents have got polling that, that these laws, these two laws are very popular with the public because they understand them. 
they know what they're there to do they feel they're relevant to them and they want them to work effectively and so they have withstood everything that the kind of deregulation um administrations have thrown at them and they've stood up to that and 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 they've come through it in part because i think really the public is behind them whereas you know by contrast if you make a law and it's just a little you know if it, even if it's the yari and a really distinguished think tank was was to say we're going to tell you what the law is we're going to tell you everything you've got to do you've just got to comply with it it's nothing to do with you just do what you're told it, it's not so attractive so i i think the public have a real role uh, and and uh, and you know depending on how much they mind about an issue if they don't mind about an issue they may shrug their shoulders and say i'll leave that to somebody else but if they do mind about the issues they is suggested they do mind about the climate um, the, the, the most effective way to do that is to become involved, I think. Perfect. Thank you very much. Samuel, can I, can I ask a question to, to William? So since we are speaking about involvement and people uh, speaking about climate change issues, I just wanted to, it's not really law related question, but just a feeling that you have on how, at what point are we in involving people about climate change issues and you know individual we have seen like don't be like greta okay because, because there's just one of it and we have to take to to have our part in this process so what do you think what are what point are we in uh letting people know about climate issues climate change topics and how uh, actually are people aware on how they can uh participate on this on this climate change uh issues and in, in the in the law process itself but also in you know ordinary um stuff that people do every day so what what point are we what, what do you think since you you treat this matter like every day of your life well i i i don't know what you think but i i think we when we started the, the cop 26 and beyond we we started it out of a sort of joint sense of frustration that people seem to be sitting back and leaving it to young people to battle away on these issues by going on strike from their schools or by protesting in the streets. And, you know, back in the far off days of 2019, 2020, that, that was what was happening. And it's still happening to some extent. And I think that, that we, we just felt, hang on, everyone in every profession has got something to contribute. Uh, and, and you know we'll try and we'll, we'll try and address this through the through through the course of this week. Tomorrow we'll be talking about you know the huge part that that engineering has has got to play in this, and that you know uh, the STEM subjects. And if you're brainy enough to have STEM subjects and, and be an engineer, great. You know, but also how it affects it's going to affect every single job, as far as we understand it, anyway. It's, it's already fundamentally affecting the whole of finance. It's affecting the whole of the legal profession is trying to pile in and, and, and get its head round what this means for them. The accountancy profession is, is, is moving massively into this area. And many, many professions are, are working out that they have something to contribute. I mean, arts and humanities um, change public opinion in touch public opinion maybe in ways that even lawyers wouldn't even contemplate you know so that that uh, if there is a genuine concern i think there's there's a role for virtually every profession every job is you know in the same way as every job is going to be affected by it i think almost every profession has got something really really important to contribute to it because the problem is so enormous Perfect. Thank you very much. I think unless we have any more um, points to discuss at this point, I'll hand over to you, Marco, to, to introduce Julia and to and, and to take us from here. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, William, for the answer. Quite, quite clear, Hi. actually. Thanks very um, much. Uh, yeah, we move to Julia that, as William anticipated, is going to speak about 
these topics from an international point of view since William has anticipated that law how law enforcement is important to, to climate change issues. And also he anticipated how law, the law related to climate change is actually as, as there is limit. And Julia is going to speak about this and how the Paris Agreement actually have some lacks that uh, are not able to help and to create a mechanism that actually impact climate change in a really proper way, according to her, according to uh, many, many people. So just a few words about Julia and then I get over to you, Julia. Julia is, um, uh, she spent the last six months between UK, in Russia and Venice in Italy, where she, she obtained the, her master degree in international relations at the Postal University. She wrote a final dissertation on the link between the climate change and the human right to help. She comes from a small town near Rome, and but she's currently living in Brussels, where she's working in a trade organization and following the latest policy developments, especially from the European institution. So yeah, just Julia, just give us a presentation about what are the limits according to you of the Paris Agreement, how can actually uh, the COP that is coming from in the last in the next months, COP26 in November, maybe can make it a better agreement. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Marco, for your introduction. And I would like to start by answering one of William, one of the questions that William posed during his intervention. He asked if the Paris Agreement was enough on its own, wouldn't the emissions be going down by now? And my answer, my personal answer is that emissions are not going down because the Paris Agreement is not enough on, uh, on its own. And according to my, my, my view, uh, there are three main reasons for, uh, for why the, this agreement is not working and it will not work if it is not changed. Uh, some of them already been mentioned. Uh, and I'll start by the most obvious one, uh, the lack of clarity, the lack of clear and precise and precise laws. Uh, this agreement has been considered a landmark, a breakthrough in international climate law. Uh, and it's considered to be the first binding treaty on, on climate. But if we go through the text from the very beginning of the test, we can understand that it does not contain clear obligations for state, clear binding obligations. Uh, the way that states are called to uh, contribute to the target, to the objective of the, of the agreement, uh, is voluntary through nationally determined contributions. So each state, each party is called to present and to communicate uh, the contribution that he wants to give to the to the agreement. To, so the, the quota uh, of reduction of emissions that they intend to achieve. And I say intend to achieve because this is the language that is used during the uh, in the treaty. Uh, not that the state must achieve, but what they intend to achieve. And this is a slight difference, but a very big difference, legally speaking, because uh, it is an obligation of conduct, non an obligation of result. So it means that the states are actually bound to provide these nationally determined contribution, but they are not bound to achieve them. They must act in a way that maybe they will achieve it, but they are not obliged to achieve it. So this is the first, uh, the first flow of the treaty. No clear uh, provisions of what the state have to, the states have to do, and the fact that the contribution is uh, voluntary says it all because each state can decide how much uh, to contribute, can decide uh, uh, how. Um, the extent to which reduce its emissions and nobody controls that nobody can say is no this is not enough or no to you're doing the bare minimum uh, because it's voluntary and this is the first uh, great flow that this treaty has for me and uh, this lack of clarity and this very broad nature of this treaty can be also seen by its language I have a, I'm not a lawyer, uh, I, I have a languages background, so for me language is very important. And you can notice that through all the treaty, 
all the verbs and all the language used are very unclear and vague. You can notice a lot of shall, would, could, but there are no must, there are no this party will. So all the treaty is conceived in a very flexible way that somehow doesn't impose anything uh, on the parties. And uh, this is the, the, the first big flow that I, for me, uh, it's in the treaty. And the second one, uh, it's obviously related to the first one. It is the lack of political will by the parties, by the states, uh, to commit to further obligations and to compromise. Uh, as you know, the Paris Agreement is an international treaty and treaties have to be negotiated. So every state brings to the negotiating table its own interests. Being a universal treaty will almost 200 um, ratifications, it is clear that each state have, has a very different interest, very different requests and needs from, uh, from this treaty. And um, the most clear, the clearest one is the difference between developed countries and non-developed countries or developing countries. There has been this confrontation ongoing since the um, Kyoto Protocol, since the establishing of the Framework Convention on climate change. So on one hand, there is the developing countries which uh, are producing a lot of emissions, but they basically need them uh, for their economic development. They are claiming the right to econo economic development. And on the other hand, there are the developed countries who are historically responsible for climate change and those who bear the most uh, responsibility, but are also those who are doing the most, at least they should, to reduce their emissions. So it is, there is this ongoing confrontation uh, between these states, which are at a very different stage of economic and technological development, because technological progress is indeed necessary to cut emissions, to reduce carbon, and I, and I think you will cover this in, tomorrow in your event about uh, energy transition. Uh, so there is no political will to uh, to compromise and commit to further obligations. Also because like all international treaties, they need also to be accepted at the domestic level. So there's also this, this, this side. And as you know, uh, in 2015, 2016, when the, when the treaty was being negotiated, uh, in many states, climate change was not recognized yet as a this great emergency, as a great risk. And I'm not talking about developing countries, but also um, the United States. Uh, you know that they withdrew from the from the treaty, but the whole process of drafting the treaty was um, deeply influenced by the political interests of the United States, which. Uh, presented a lot of requests and in the end the um this vague and unclear structure of the treaty was deeply influenced by the request of Barack Obama because he knew that uh, a more binding uh, treaty with clear obligations with clear provision would have never been accepted and ratified by the Senate by the US Senate and so there was no point of signing the treaty as a president if the Senate then doesn't, doesn't ratify it. So he had to fight, he had to negotiate uh, to have this like, more flexible uh, treaty. And in general, all the developed countries like Australia, Canada, uh, less the European Union, but on some level the European Union as well, opposed to a more binding treaty. And so there is a, a huge lack of political will to actually do something. Uh, we found like polit politicians always promising to do something about climate change, but when it actually comes to uh, commit themselves to more um, binding laws to do actually something, uh, then they back off. And they, the final reason, which is what William was talking about, is also to um, uh, to answer to Atif's question uh, is that the lack of an enforcement body. This, this treaty doesn't have an enforcement body and uh, in general international treaty usually do not have inter uh, enforcement bodies but especially climate law doesn't have one. He means that uh, states 
can do whatever they want because there is no monitoring, there is no uh, corrective measures, there are no punishments for those who uh, do not respect their voluntary, uh, their voluntary um, contributions. And this, of course, leaves a, a, a void that cannot be filled because uh, states feel free to do um, to keep uh, their policies and not to comply with, uh, with, with the law. And while some academics found this decision not to um, involve an, an uh, enforcement body in the treaty quite positive, because it, it was like a sort of an incentive to countries to have ambitious targets uh, to the treaty, because if there is no punishment for not compliance, you may have more ambitious targets. For example, the European Union, uh, we presented a very ambitious target to cut our emissions by 55% by 2030, and I think it's very ambitious and kind of unrealistic. Maybe with an enforcement body who could have corrective measures or, I don't know, uh, sanctions in case you fail, this ambitious target would have never been achieved, would have never be upset. Uh, so some some people see that as a positive, uh, not uh, as a positive outcome of the treaty, not as a lack. But it's obvious that it is a problem because these laws are not enforced. So what's the point of having a, of having a law is no one is enforcing it. And uh, uh, to answer your question, and if I'm not a lawyer, so maybe you know better than, than me, my, the problem with international law is that uh, it's made by states, so why states will never give up part of the sovereignty to be controlled, to be monitored by a sovereign national body. So uh, why should they do that? So this is the main problem. And uh, this is why I think that the Paris Agreement, it's, uh, it's not enough. It will never be enough on its own. And like you said, the law is not the only option to, to solve this, uh, this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for quite a critical view of the, the Paris Agreement. I actually uh, agree with many, many points and uh, it's quite, you are really nicely illustrated all the problems that actually are set in languages, in the approach, in actually in the not interest, in the not interest by state to actually apply the, the, the treaty that they have, they have been signed. So, yeah, quite, quite nice. I don't know if anybody has some question to for Julia from the audience. Just raise your hands and see if we have somebody. Or Atif, I don't know if you want to comment to the the answer that Julia actually provided to you. Uh, that is quite quite an interesting point of view. Um, yeah, in a way, she's right, really. There should be some kind of, um, what do you call it, um, enforcement kind of mechanism, isn't it, in a way? Because you make all these things and, and there's no one to enforce them, really, kind of, because things happen in the open, isn't it, in the environment, so... Yeah, yeah I mean, what, what, what's the point of spending years trying to negotiate yeah. a treaty? It, then there is no one to actually control and monitor if exactly. this treaty yeah. is is respected. Uh, mm, I don't know. It's like on paper, it sounds good. The Paris Agreement yeah. sounds good, but yeah, but like would you when say that there are things in the Paris Agreement which are sometimes impossible to enforce, or would you not say that? In your uh, opinion, I think that uh, some issues are uh, impossible to, to yeah, enforce. That's what because... I feel as well with loads of laws, really. That, Environmental laws yeah, are possible it's to too, enforce. Sometimes they're it's quite unrealistic. Too technical. They're really written yeah. in a technical way, and then they're impossible to enforce, which makes no sense at all. Yeah. Yeah. You're right on that. Okay, William, I think you have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Uh, well, I agree with some of it, but I, I quite disagree with some of it because. Um, uh, I, but it was it was a brilliant sort of critique of the of the Paris Agreement. I, I, I agree that, that treaties, it really matters what is the machinery in the treaty for having it reviewed and having it um, 
monitored step by step, implemented step by step, rather than just having a single obligation. But in the end of the day, with international law as opposed to national law, enforcement is to some extent by public and peer pressure, by the kind of pressure that uh, countries are under scrutiny right now mm. as to what they're going to do, um, <clears throat> rather than treaty machinery. I mean, you can have treaty machinery, but, but at the end of the day, it, it, it does depend on the second of the points that, that Julia made, which is the political will. And you either have the political will or you don't have the political will. If they, and, and this is really what it all comes down to, I think. 197 countries or whatever it was signed the Paris Agreement. And it's not quite correct to say that it's got no machinery. It doesn't have strong enough machinery, but they, they agreed to the aim of holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade. They agreed the machinery of submitting nationally determined contributions. They agreed that those nationally determined contributions in Article 3 should be progressively more ambitious. And they agreed to um, uh, transparency measures in Article 13. And they also agreed to a global stock take in Article 14, which is also extremely important. But it's important in terms of transparency, in terms of making it clear what they are or aren't prepared to do. And then 195 countries signed off on the science of the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report on the physical science base on the 9th of August. So 195 countries in the world basically said, we have no objection to or we don't take any issue with your assessment of the science which is dire i mean you know the united nations secretary general says this is code red for humanity and unless we take urgent action you know on the basis of this science we we will we will go to hell so i i agree with you julia that that the machinery could be much stronger could be clearer and, and needs to be developed. I, I don't really agree that it's of no value at all, but I just think it's a step in the way towards the, 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 the world deciding whether or not it has the collective political will to do something about the science which it essentially accepts. Yes, Julia, please, if you want to answer, yeah. No, no, I just wanted to make clear that, of course, uh, this is, uh, was a very uh, critical view of the Paris Agreement, but I, I, I don't think that it's pointless or is useless, of, of course. Uh, there are many, many advantages of this agreement. Uh, what I wanted to make clear is that, uh, of course, like the political will of parties to sign this treaty, it's already a lot to the fact that uh, if a country doesn't comply, uh, does, doesn't comply with a, with a nationally contribution, nationally determined contribution, is still that you have like public pressure, you you lose face. Like I mentioned, the European Union with a very ambitious target. Uh, what happens if we don't achieve this target? Probably you lose credibility, you lose face. So this is still something. But um, what I wanted to say is that this issue is so urgent, is so important, that it's an emergency that maybe we actually needed a uh, stronger machinery. That's um, that is my that is my point. Okay. And also a good point I'd like to stress about the language that sometimes makes difference in, in treaties. No, there are a lot of as, as Julia said, there are a lot of shell good uh, instead of a state must do something. So this is something that actually um, could could change if they are going to to negotiate a new uh, treaty in COP26. So Samuel, uh, other question, please. Yeah, a question for, for, for both Julia and William. Um, you've been talking about sort of strengthening um, the enforcement mechanism. How, how would you do that? 
um and can you have any ideas about like maybe another treaty or another area of law where it works really well um i assume if you're going to have something international where all countries agree to be sanctioned by a law you have to have a body that's respected and seen as legitimate um is that the un you know how if, if i'm a cop 26 negotiator and i go in and take julia's points and say you know you're absolutely right we need to strengthen this um what do you have in mind if, how would i do it julia uh i'm not uh, a lawyer so maybe i don't have the experience to uh to say this but um, if like at, at the moment like currently if we have to consider a, a body which is respected and recognized by uh, each state it's that's the united uh, nations so uh, maybe start from there and we we saw that sometimes in other cases not related to climate but for example war or human rights violations the un um, security council has uh, used sanctions or maybe um, stopped uh, the the trade with uh, some countries who were violating uh, some kind of international laws or international standards so we may start from that we may start treating climate change as um, maybe a international wrong, wrongful act or um, we may start treating climate change as we maybe treated the um covid 19 pandemic as a like emergency that uh touches the whole world and for urgent and urgent measures and needed that's my point but as i said i'm not an expert in in the sector so maybe william will have a better answer to to, to solve this no oh, thank you very much i mean uh, i i think that you know you can sometimes say well there should be an external body or an international body that 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 should sort of pronounce on these things but it's very very difficult in practice to to set up one which will command enough support in your political support you can imagine sort of saying I, I think, you know, we should have uh, an extra territorial, extra international body uh, that will adjudicate on the claims of sort of China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, uh, Europe, America. You know, you can you can see quite a lot of political difficulties there. I mean, I, I used to work with a guy who I always wanted to go and learn from him because he used to be the big expert on international um, <clears throat> international machinery of making environmental treaties more effective uh, and 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 he he took it in small pieces i think so you'd have elements of regular reporting you'd have elements of expert committees with 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 involvement sort of to tie in more countries into the outcomes you'd have regular plans you'd have um specific provisions on funding instead of having to battle for this sort of total that like they're they're doing at the moment you have regular reviews and you know like the global stock take that's in the paris agreement and you'd have maybe a specific response to the ipcc science because at the moment it seems that in one room the ipc scientists can can come up with dire warnings and then nobody has to respond to them so you can you could build in the machinery of making a specific response to those things. What are you going to do about it? This is what they say. What now are we going to do about it? Uh, and, and I think you have to build it up incrementally in bits and pieces like that uh, in order to get more acceptable enforcement machinery. Okay, okay, guys, thank you. Really, really interesting. We have a question actually from Martina Rimarki in the chat. I don't know if she wants to come up or I should get her question and go to our to William and Julia. Martina. Yes, uh, hi, everybody. I want to, so thank you for the clear explanation. I really agree with Julia and I really appreciate the, um, the explanation uh, of William Wilson. And I would like to know, uh, what do you think about this proposal uh, of Philip Sands and the um, 
the Stop Ecocide Foundation because they want to propose and to add uh, this ecocide term and definition as a new crime to the Rome Statute as we were uh, talking about this, uh, this point. And so in your opinion, would that be a step forward or just something very difficult to achieve, something that actually uh, does not change a lot? Thank you. I don't know who wants to reply, William or Julia. Yeah, I can have a go. I mean, I, I know that this is, um, I'm probably a minority view here because um, I, I'm hesitant about the, 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 the proposal for an ecocide thing, not because I, I think we can all think of some, some instances where you would broadly recognize hugely destructive actions as ecocide or you know and it may be so bad that that you know people would be deterred by the threat of uh, of going to the the um the, the the international criminal court i know that my former professor philippe sands is actually uh, a believer in this my concern i think is about whether it would devalue the other crimes against humanity uh and genocide um, <clears throat> whether they would be diluted in some way by being compared to ecocide, particularly if people were going to sort of bandy about ecocide as in, in all sorts of cases, such as where there was a land use planning uh, objection uh, and, and so on. So, so I I would sort of only really support it if it was if it was in some way confined and restricted to the most serious. Um, kinds of of environmental destruction that that we face at the moment, and then then if that was the case, then 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 I would I would support it. I noticed, for example, to, to argue against myself, it was strongly supported by the the youth representatives at Mock Crop. They were all for it. Thanks, William. Thanks, William. I don't know if Martina is. Uh, yeah, Julia, please. No, 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 I just wanted to, to say that I partially agree with William with what he's saying is that I, I think that on one hand it would be a step forward, maybe uh, a way to actually have an enforcement of climate laws if we uh, reach the uh, uh, like international recognition of this crime. But I agree with William with his, um, when he says that it's a really broad definition. It's really difficult to define what to consider as hecocide and whatnot like the, the the criteria should be very 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 clear and the the effects of climate change on on people are too different are too uh, many and they are direct they are indirect in, in so many ways you have like uh, climate change impacting your your health your life your job your work your your house your uh, the place where you, where you live, the, the the entire environment. So it's mm, it's very difficult to find uh, a specific definition for um, for ecocide. So I'm in favor of this proposal, but mm, it has to be elaborated in a way that it's it's clear what they mean and that it cannot be used in the in the future just as an excuse to enforce some laws or to in advantage of something. So that was my uh, yeah that's what i wanted to add yes thank you so with this point we come back to one of the first points that william raised up about how it is important for the law to be clear and to be focused on, on on a specific matter yeah so thank you martina for your question we have a question from alessandro i don't know if you alessandro wants want to come up we and ask the question or I should read it. Alessandro, no, maybe you're not there. Anyway, he wanted to ask a question for Julia, but of course it's for both our uh, guests. Uh, and he asked if Blue Origins program, Jeff Bezos program, is turning to reality. Uh, he asked if he's going to be soon claimed as the most effective stakeholder on the climate change issue, on the climate change cause. 
What is your opinion about it? It's just a well plan or it's just one plan propaganda from a space company or a practical solution from a philanthropy. So what's your point on Jeff Bezos' uh, project of Blue Origin if it comes, if it turns into reality? Is really something that can impact the climate change goals or it's just propaganda from um, a philanthropist? I think maybe it may be both. I think that I'm, I'm not a fan of Jeff Bezos and in general this like billionaires philanthropist but uh, so I think that in the, the main scope it's just a well-planned propaganda from a very rich man who wants to become richer that's my personal view but I also think that since he's a, one of the richest person in the world if he manages to use his wealth his money and uh, the tools and the all is as in his hands to actually do something good for for the planet for the climate case then i would definitely support it i mean if if not them like if not jeff bezos or bill gates who has the power to actually do something if not them who so i even even though i'm not a big fan of him uh like maybe it is for a good purpose i don't know what you, what the other things think about it yeah I, I can actually understand and i'm with you on this point so william would, do you want to reply to to, to alessandro yes i <clears throat> i posted a comment for alessandro in the in the in the chat which is that um i i, I don't know i think that sort of billionaires in space sort of slightly lost on me as as being the answer to all these problems that we're dealing with but i i do think it'd be imaginative if if someone could persuade him to do it to 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 say to jeff bezos why doesn't amazon take primary responsibility for protection of the amazon i think that would be just a sort of you know a marketing coup that that uh, you know he could put some of these billions into that and, and it would be fantastic and it would do actually measurable measurable good so i'd like to suggest that as an alternative yeah that's that's a good point also is i don't know if alessandro wants wants to reply that but yeah actually i agree that <clears throat> it would be good if these really wealth people actually may have a really really a important impact on climate change with, with useful policies, with useful art, and not just for amplify their, their company's interests. And yeah, I don't know if Alessandro wants to reply. Uh, otherwise, I have, uh, yeah, Alessandro, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, first of all, thank you, thank you everybody for replying to my question and to participate. And after this conversation, I think I have a little, a little doubt. What if the next, the next main character are not states, but instead private entities? Because, for example, in the space sector, we're talking about big companies which has a... a more powerful and affection than um, than states for example spacex or the same virgin galactic which is like the third of the most powerful companies in the space sector so what about so taking care of the administrative section i mean not the institutional one but solution came solution came from the private entities Okay, I think, yeah, he's right when he, Alessandro, thank you for, for your reply, and he's right when he mentioned like this company is a big actor in, in, in international, uh, in international stage. So it's not just states, but also big companies that have a big, big effect and influence also on government. So what's William and Julia, how do you? Well, I have no no problem with uh, private sector sort of progress and private sector solutions if it works and if it delivers results. And uh, if Jeff Bezos and Amazon were able to deliver wonderful things for the environment, then then fine. You know, just just let let let's crack on with it. I can't quite see how it's done by the space program, but maybe I'm just not 
not looking in the right direction. I'm sure that there's there's 101 things they could do to help with all sorts of uh, aspects of climate change. I, uh, I agree with, with Alessandra. I mean, uh, I think we are in an age where, yes, like mm, war changes also the, this kind of action change. So yes, probably the states are not the, the main characters of climate action anymore and private companies, private business maybe uh, are those who actually have to have to do something about it. And because they are the main responsible, I mean, now it's not the single state, but the different um, multinationals and international companies that uh, produce emissions. So even if we talk about all the carbon removal strategies, carbon uh, storage or carbon reutilization, it's from, like it comes from private companies. The fact that we need to rebuild a whole new value chain for each industry, it comes from the private company. So uh, yeah, they should be in, involved. I don't know how to involve them in law making because of course they need, like their action needs to be regulated by, by laws. But mm, yeah, mm, I think that the focus should not be only state centered, but also uh, looking at private entities, because like in the in this era that we're living, they a big part of the of the problem. Yeah, yeah, we actually agree on that. So we have a question from Alessandro. Know if you want to reply, otherwise I give the mic to Michelangelo. Okay, I was so happy and glad to hear their opinion because we are on the same same line yes i totally agree with them because the world is changing drastically and for my experience or maybe maybe this is not a, maybe this is not the best case but taking dealing with politicians is somehow harder than dealing with entrepreneurs i mean they're both focusing on interests what they are interested into. But when we talk about the young people, when we talk about how they would like to change this world, it's very, very difficult to deal with politicians because they are many, no, they're mainly present centered. They're not looking for their ability, not, well, at least not to everybody, but their ability to look forward to see the future. Like just simple, simply putting this question, how do you see the world in the next 20 years? It put, that, put them in difficulty. So they're not really taking care of the young needs because they're young and they're, maybe they may be a deal in the future. So this is very complicated. Maybe entrepreneurship are more, more sensitive to some kind of issues that will turn, will be turning customers. That's it. So, William, Julia, is the private world more more sensitive to this to these kind of issues? It may be. I I just say it it may be that Alessandro is right, but I think you have to deal with both. I think you have to deal with the politicians as difficult as they may be, because they exercise a lot of power and because they were elected to do that job and 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 they have the ability to make laws, whether the laws are right or wrong or good or bad. So I think you can't walk away from dealing with them, that you may be completely right, that you could make more progress in particular areas by, by dealing with uh, entrepreneurs. And, and there, there are other people who, who have a longer perspective. I completely agree. Julia, you agree with that? <laughs> no, no, I, I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree with, with both. I mean, I agree with Alessandro when he says that um, the private sectors and entrepreneurs are definitely more visionary and like more looking forward than yeah. politicians who mainly care about getting consensus from the next three elections. But as William said, it's it's impossible to divide the two things. I mean, you, you I think that the best solution would be a close collaboration with the two uh -huh. sectors. Uh, but you can get rid of politics. I mean, it's mm, it's needed. There's no world without mm, politics or politicians. And I'm not sure this is a good thing, but we, we have to deal with that. So <laughs> at the moment, at we least. cannot <laughs> get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely clear, clear enough. So we have a question from Michelangelo, I think. Yes, thank you, Marco. 
hello everybody uh, i wanted only to reply about this topic about the participation of the entrepreneurship on low making and all this stuff well i think that we don't uh, we didn't consider the fact that entrepreneurs are very bond with politicians and uh, uh, so this uh, conversation between them is still and um, very strong because if we consider all the uh, f uh, fossil fuels uh, argument and topics and uh, how these interests are uh, continu uh, continuing to grow in the and are still uh, supplied by the politics and the laws of today. Well, we have this problem about uh, the private entity that is uh, is battling against uh, um, climate change solutions. So I think that, sorry for my English, uh, I think that um, we we have to consider uh, carefully the role of the entrepreneurs and the lobbying of all the private interests so states and uh, politicians have to deal and have to understand what are the priorities in all the in the actual situation so uh, in my opinion we have the tools and the private sector ha has the tools to deal with climate change and to force politicians to look at better regulations about uh, climate change and to create an effective, a more effective system of laws, uh, of national laws uh, that could be enforced without any problem. But there is no politic political uh, will to do this. And sorry, it was only uh, my, my point of view of the situation. And I wanted to give another perspective of the topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelangelo. It's quite a good point because we actually cannot avoid to think about the bond that actually exists between the political world and the private world. As we were saying before, we have these big companies that actually don't work as you know unique entities but they are actually uh, influencing the political world we have seen cases from amazon itself from the big companies such as google we know how big is the impact of these companies on our world and how they actually shape uh, people thinking and political leadership thinking also is something it's really a good point because it's something that we really can't avoid to consider so i uh, uh, I, yeah, I um, turn this question to William, question, this point to William and Julia, and also I want to add something, uh, because it's something that I actually don't know, so I'm sorry for my, for my uh, lack on this, but uh, when the COP negotiation go ahead, does, linking to this point that Michelangelo has raised up, does any private companies have some space in debating, in speaking, in not of course not in lawmaking this is something that i should i should know but uh does do they have any space during this negotiation sorry marco if i interrupt you uh, but i wanted to point out that uh italian government has uh given a lot of space um to any the first uh, <laughs> italian uh fossil fuel uh, <laughs> extractor in yeah. Europe, maybe, or not in Europe, but there are so many in Italy, for sure. So uh, the power of the lobbies for this kind of actor actors is very, very huge. So sorry, William, if I've taken your space. Thank you. Not at all. I, I, I think you made very important points and, and they kind of balance out, don't they? The, the, the view that the, the private sector's got a lot to contribute, but also it's got its responsibilities. Uh, and actually, we can't walk away from dealing with politicians and from becoming involved in 
so I, I, I think it supports my original argument <laughs> that, that, that we, we, we have to get involved in, in making the laws because, you know, for sure, companies will get involved and lobbyists will get involved and, and, and laws made by that on, on their own won't be very good ones. And therefore, you need to open it out to a broader public, find ways to re-energize the links between the public and parliaments. I think parliaments, including our own, should be less set in their ways. They should go out to meet more young people. They should engage more young people in their debates, listen to groups such as such as this, such as the pre-COP delegates, the COI 16 delegates, you know, turn tune in to them and and listen to them and respond to them and show them how participation in lawmaking can work show them how they can make an effective difference rather than just say we've always done it this way we're not listening to you and you you've got nothing to contribute julia anything to add thank you william uh no just to briefly uh answer your question my opinion is that uh of course at the negotiating table of cop private sector has no place but they are relevant stakeholders so they can influence all the the path before getting to the uh, to the cop because in the end uh when talking about mm, mm, emission reduction or cutting emission is like it affects those company. So of course they uh, can and they do influence the, the governed position on how to, to negotiate uh, the uh, treaty on, on climate also because uh, all the, the funds that the government put into, into the financial mechanism of the, uh, of the they also The, the state owned companies, all the international companies, all that is transboundary uh, effects that there are from international companies. So they surely have an influence on the state position. It's not direct, it's rather implicit, but, but sure, they, they, they do. So um, to go back to our original discussion about should we like uh, trust the action of private companies, of private en en entrepreneurs, uh, my point is also um, if they have the means, yes, but also, uh, for example, Jeff Bezos, uh, can we uh, elect him like the most um, important stakeholder in climate action, even when we know what Amazon does to uh, workers' rights and how they are exploited? It's all interconnected. I think that you cannot uh divide uh, sustainability and workers rights and all the materials that are used it's all interconnected so we also need to think about this i mean uh, jeff bezos of a person as an individual show is a famous character who can do something about the climate but what does its com its company do uh, so i think this is also something we should think about Yeah, right, right. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Very, very clear. Uh, I do have another question about how the negotiation in COP actually goes, because uh, of course I, I don't know how the mechanism is is uh, in, in detail. So, how you mentioned that actually U.S. in the last uh, and Obama's approach also has something as um, an impact on other parties' uh, negotiations. So. I want to ask how how is this possible that U.S. Uh, or another country has this kind of power and actually uh, they actually you know uh, not compromise but of course um, make the treaty that go in in a, in a certain direction otherwise in another. So my question is how is it possible that you know big powers, big countries like U.S. or you know, or, or China, or these like really big polluting countries, can actually have this kind of influence on other countries, uh, even if you know the 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 speaking and the confrontation is public and is 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 open to everybody. Uh, I mean, uh, my my answer will be pretty critical 
also in this case, so maybe William will have something to, to add, but uh, as a treaty that needs to be negotiated in the end, uh, the, the winning part is those who have like the great bargaining power, in this case, the United States. Uh, they have not only power, but they have uh, money. So uh, what is important also for the, for the treaty, for the agreement is the uh, financial support that each country gives to the to the treaty that's the financial mechanism of the treaty which is the green climate fund and which was established with the aim of to gather i think 100 billion dollars per year to support the uh, uh the green transition to support the adaptation of like less developed countries to uh, climate change, and I think that uh, the COP could not, could, couldn't afford the United States not to sign the, the agreement. Or, of course, uh, not having the United States on board or not having the state of Kiribati on board with the treaty uh, was going to make a difference. So I think that in the end, what really influenced this the process, the, what made the whole treaty shaped according to some state requests was the fact that in the end it was the state who contributes the most to the to the financial mechanism and th that was something that couldn't be uh, avoided that's my opinion and to the pollution of the world okay <laughs> just uh, okay william i don't know if, <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, i agree with the, i agree with a lot of that and it's just like you know big powerful states uh, that you need to try to include them in the agreement rather than exclude them uh, just as you know now you've got china it has 1082 coal fired power stations and and you know if if it just chooses to carry on without doing anything about that, it's going to be very difficult to achieve the Paris Agreement targets, um, as it is with other countries. India gets 80% of its power from coal, uh, as do, do, do other countries. So it's it's a question now, sort of, you know, the IEA and the IPCC reports have been delivered. The logic of them is that, that there should be an end to fossil fuels. It's easier said than done. There needs to be a just transition. But, you know, the the effort is still to try and keep the consensus together and to try to keep the, the, the world um, it facing in the same direction so that it can deliver what it agreed to do in Paris and so that it can deliver on the logic of what it's agreed with signing off the IPCC reports. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Marco. Yeah, I was, I, I was, I'm conscious of time, so maybe, maybe we should draw to a conclusion it would be delightful to have this conversation all, all, all day but I'll, I'll let you make any final remarks perhaps and then i've i'll say a bit about the events coming up um in the next couple of days yeah i, I actually don't know if alessandro wants to ask the last question or i didn't delay delete the the the, the, the label uh, but i really want to thank you all for the lovely discussion i'm really happy that it kept up it kept us really really uh together discussing really interesting issues and thank you again sam william for for the coordination mm -hmm. for for organizing this this event together and thanks to julia to have uh, uh, so clearly so critically addressed this this uh these topics and yeah for me is everything and thank you thank you and uh, see you on tomorrow and day after tomorrow so i leave you the last the last Remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Yeah, I'll just echo that. I, I really appreciate your your contribution and everyone at Yari. Particularly big thanks to to Julia for for all your preparation and your Grazie. really fascinating comments. Grazie, and, and and thank you to 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 William as well. And particular thanks to Atif um, uh, uh, for, for your contributions. Really, really appreciated. Um, yeah, if it, it we, we'd be delighted to welcome you tomorrow. We have an event uh, on engineering for the energy transition. Um, with lots of uh, fascinating sort of engineers and experts in renewable engineering, in wind power, in solar power. So do come along to that um, and, and learn about how engineering can help. And then the day after, um, we'll be hosting um, all sorts of experts for, uh, to discuss climate change and the future of jobs. Um, so very much look forward to these uh, these events over the next few days. And thank you all very much for joining and, and for, for everyone for contributing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye.
Bye bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.